Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the AES Scotland 2018 Christmas Lecture live from Codebase here in Stirling. So my name's Kenny, and despite the Glasgow accent, although to be precise, it's a North Lanarkshire one, I'm from just along the road in Airdrie, uh, and I work at the University of Melbourne in Australia, having just moved there from Aberté University in Dundee. Now, I've always been interested in all aspects of sound recording and production, but I seem to have become best known for sound design and music production for video games. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you all about today. Now, just before we go any further, I'm going to take an educated guess and assume that most of you enjoy gaming. So could I just see a quick show of hands to see who has played a video game, any kind, could be console, PC, mobile phone, at least once in the last week. OK, so that's practically everybody. Those who didn't stick your hand up, do you not play? The interesting thing is, you're the ones that stand out. Now again, I'd like you to stick up your hands if you enjoy playing first person games. So that could be role-playing games, shooters, survival horrors, driving games. Who likes playing that sort of stuff? Okay, so again, you didn't play a minute ago. <laughs> okay, fair point, fair point. Uh, could anyone tell me what they particularly like about those games? Yeah, absolutely. So there's that sense of presence and immersion. You feel like you're part of the action. What about the sound and the music? Has anyone listened to those games and noticed how the music works with the gameplay? Anybody over here? Okay, so the sound and the music make you feel more immersed in the game. And it's that notion of interaction and immersion and sound that I really want to focus on and talk about today. So we're going to begin by looking at where video game sound started and how it came to sound the way that it did. Then we're going to have a look at interactivity and how that makes writing music for games a real challenge and what tricks and techniques composers and sound designers use to make interactive soundtracks. And then finally, we're going to round off by thinking about what the game soundtracks, and particularly what the VR soundtracks of the future might sound like. Now, I'm going to be accompanied up on stage today by my trusty lab-coated science elf, James here, who is essentially the mirror image of me. I'm right-handed, he's left-handed, and as you can see from all of that fluffy hair underneath his chin, his head's been glued on upside down. Say hello, James. Hello, James. Now, to begin, could I get two volunteers to come up and play a state-of-the-art head-to-head -head video game tournament? So we've got one chap over here. Do we have another volunteer? We do need two for this. Great. Haley chap at the end. Could you both come up? And everybody else, give them a nice warm round of applause. <laughs> Excellent. Up you come. And you are? Matthew, nice to meet you, Matthew. What school are you from? Um, Fort Valley College. Fort Valley College. And you are? I'm Lewis. Lewis. Help me come. Right, so I'll hand you over to James. And while James prepares you for your epic gameplay experience, I'll tell everyone else about the state-of-the-art game that you're going to play. It's called Pong, and it was absolutely state-of-the-art when it was released by Atari back in 1972. So for those of you who are used to gaming just now, uh, this might seem a bit crude, but we've already started, and player one is already two points up. Is this going to be a total whitewash? I should say, in defense of our players, this is phenomenally difficult to play. It depends on a really high degree of precision and lightning-fast reactions, neither of which our players seem to have. Although, we are getting a bit of a rally going there, uh, but it does look like player one has this pretty much tied up. Come on, player two, if you can just knock one back, there's maybe a fighting chance you can stage a comeback. It's match point and, oh, a total whitewash. Well played. Please, everybody, give a round of applause. <laughs> well done. Well done, Matthew. Now, Pong here wasn't the first video game. 
In fact, it wasn't even the first video game with sound. But it is an important game. And it's important because it managed to do something that none of its predecessors had. It really captured the public imagination. And this is probably the game that made video gaming a true pop culture phenomenon. In fact, Pong was such a runaway success that it literally became a victim of that own success. Just a fortnight after they'd installed the first Pong machine in a diner in California, Atari got a call from the manager to say that the machine had stopped working. Now, when they went to investigate, a pile of coins spewed out from the machine. So many people had wanted to play that the coin mechanism had become jammed. So, by today's standards, yes, the graphics and the sound of Pong are pretty crude, but let's take a step back and think about them in context. Now, what we have here is a picture of the DEC PDP-1, which was a popular computer from the time. It was built from 2,700 transistors and 3,000 diodes. So this was the days before microprocessors. And this basic model without any peripherals would have cost the equivalent of about a million dollars in today's money. It was about the size of a small hatchback car, think Honda Civic, and it had a fraction of the memory and the processing power that you'd find even in a basic mobile phone today. It was most at home in university computing labs because at this point, almost nobody had a computing device at home. So you can imagine that walking into a diner or a grocery store and seeing a machine in the corner that had a, an eye-catching graphical display and electronic sound and that would play games for a quarter ago, well, that was something totally exciting and new. So yet, those graphics weren't showy, but they did the job and the gameplay was addictive. That jammed coin mechanism tells us just how addictive that it was. Now, Pong was designed by an engineer, Alan Alcorn. But it's important to remember that he was doing this with nothing but instinct to guide him. He was working at a time before high-level programming languages. So those of you who've done computing at school might have come across a programming language called C. Now, today, that's used everywhere in applications development. But back then, C had only just been invented. And video game development was still largely hardware-based and in its infancy. So with no rules or conventions to draw upon, Alcorn really had no option but to improvise. He went to his local Walgreens drugstore and he bought himself a black and white television set for $75. Now, to that television set, he added his own game circuit, which was just a jumble of wires and diode arrays, and then stuck on a couple of rotary controllers. Now, when it came to sound, Alcorn's bosses had really high expectations for the game. They told him that what they wanted was the roar of a crowd cheering when you won a point and a boo and a hiss when you lost. Now, Alcorn didn't have the first idea how to make any of those sounds. And in any case, he was fast running out of components on his circuit board. So instead, he poked around inside the sync generator, that part of the electronic circuit that generates the electronic timing signals that keeps everything working together. And he used those signals that were already present in the electrical components as the game sounds. Let's have a listen. So almost by accident then, rather than by design, the shape and the sound of video game sound had been defined. It was square and it was pretty bleepy. And in all honesty, video game sound and music didn't really change very much for the next 20 years. There were improvements, of course, but they didn't really change the fundamental characteristics and qualities of the music and the sound that video games produced. My first computer was a Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus. This one, in fact. Now, that was the machine that really launched the games industry in the UK. And just like Pong, it could only produce one channel of sound. But to make matters worse, the Spectrum had no dedicated sound hardware at all. 
Its speaker was wired directly to one of the pins of the computer's main processor, and activating it tied up all of the Spectrum's meager power, meaning that while it was beeping, the Spectrum couldn't, without some very clever coding, do anything else. But because the technology was so limited in what it could do, musicians and programmers, and, and often they were one and the same, had no option but to come up with some really inventive and innovative ways of coding music for games. Code that would maybe push that hardware beyond its capabilities. Now that innovative technical creativity for me is one of the most interesting bits of this period of game audio history. And it was an approach that worked fantastically well. In the space of just a couple of years, composers worked out how to take the ZX Spectrum's weedy little speaker from this to this. All of that then just comes from a single channel, tiny little speaker hanging off a processor. Some computer sound chips, though, offered more possibilities than the Spectrum. More channels, a broader range of sound signals to choose from, or more sophisticated uh, synthesis. So, for example, the Commodore 64 introduced a sound chip called the SID, which was really designed like a mini synthesizer. Alongside three channels of tone generation, it could do filtering and frequency modulation. Add in that inventive coding that we talked about and the musical ideas of its composers, and you end up with something like this, Rob Hubbard's theme from Commando. <laughs> Though. Although, as you can hear, it's a great track, it's much busier and more inventive in terms of how those synthetic bleepy sounds are used, fundamentally, the music is still pretty bleepy. It has a completely different character to even the sort of electronic synth pop that people listened to back in the 1980s. Video game music just sounded different from everything else. Now, that all changed with the launch of Sony's PlayStation in the mid-1990s. It had an integrated CD-ROM drive, and that made it possible to stream recorded music directly from disc. So for the very first time, video game music could sound every bit as polished and produced as commercial music. And all of a sudden, game designers fell over themselves to license big-name artists on video game soundtracks. The futuristic racing game Wipeout was one of the PlayStation launch titles, and it featured a, a really high-octane electronic soundtrack that was mostly composed by video game music composer Tim Wright, with some tracks licensed from Left Field, The Chemical Brothers, and Orbital. Sony also licensed music from some non-mainstream electronica acts to create an original soundtrack album that was released to promote the game in 1996. Let's take a quick look. So the PlayStation then really normalized the idea that music and games could sound every bit as good as the music that you might actually listen to at home. And from that point, things moved on really quickly. Now, you might have heard the term convergence before, which relates to the way that different technological platforms evolve over time to perform the same sorts of tasks. Just think about how the mobile phone has evolved to become a handheld 
personal computer, on a music player, on a video player, on a gaming machine. Well, this, I think, was the point where games really began to converge with movies, particularly with those first-person role-playing games. The PlayStation introduced graphic chips that enabled high-quality, high-frame-rate 3D visuals that put you, the player, right in the heart of the action. And its sound chip and its CD-ROM drive gave you high-quality sound and music to match. But there were still challenges. And perhaps the most important of these was how to make that high-quality CD audio work with interactive gameplay. Now, I recently spoke to Colin Anderson, who, back when the PlayStation launched, was head of audio at DMA Designs and produced the music for the first two Grand Theft Auto games. Now, I asked him how that shift away from sound chips to production music changed the way that people used sound in video games. It, it was pros and cons. It wasn't just all pros. But the, the pros that you got was definitely the fidelity of the, the audio that you could create. It gave you access to the same resources that the film and television industry would use, for example. And that meant for the first time you could use real recordings of real instruments of real sound effects, so actual door closing, instead of having to synthesize them in some way, approximately. So it was really good from that perspective. It also gave you great, uh, great use of talent as well, because suddenly you didn't have this barrier where it was only coders who could work in the space. You had this thing where the you could work with sound designers who had experience in other media, so that was good. The cons were things like interactivity. We lost interactivity for a while. The synth chips were particularly good because they were being coded at quite a low level. They were really good at responding to, to gameplay as it moved, and that sort of went away when we started using CE and things like that. And also expectations changed really quickly as well. Suddenly the novelty of, hey, this has got a CD soundtrack went away and people were just like, Okay, we expect that. Of course, it's going to be a CD soundtrack. What else have you got? Uh, it was it was a real a real game changer in that respect. So yeah, it was pros and cons, but it was as you say, a really exciting time. Now, Colin mentioned interactivity there, and as a concept, it's one that's right at the very heart of video gaming. It might even be the most important aspect of all, because without interaction, you don't have a video game. You just have a video, a non-playable cutscene. And how many of you skip the cutscenes? But interactivity is also the thing that makes writing music for games a real challenge. And to illustrate, let's think about film. When a composer has to write music for a film, structurally, most of the work is already done for them. They get an edited section of film, it will be a certain length, and the events in the story will happen in the same order every time they watch it. In other words, the composer has a framework that they can use to plan and to write to, and so they can just get on with the job of actually writing the music. The same isn't true for a video game. Think about it. Everybody plays games differently. Do any of you ever watch speedrunners play games? They blitz through levels as quickly as possible. On the other hand, other players, and I'm probably one of them, take the time, they pick up all of the power-ups and explore every bit of every level. So what game events happen and what order they happen in will be totally different for each player. And they'll be determined by the particular player and their particular approach to play. Now, for the composer, that's a real challenge because now they have to write music for game events that might or might not happen. And they have to write the music in such a way that if and when the music cues are needed, they will work with whatever else is happening in the soundtrack at that point. Now, in some games, that can be done really quite simply. Now, when I was a kid, I used to pump 10 pence pieces into this game, Space Invaders. Now, if you listen really carefully, under the pinging of the lasers and the explosions, you hear a really simple repeating musical line, a descending minor scale. Now, as you start to play and pick off the invaders, that little musical line speeds up. And of course, your heart rate 
and your breathing, tune into it. So as you play, you begin to feel the tension in the game rise just as effectively as you would in any movie thriller. But of course, the solution isn't always as straightforward as speeding up the music. Different types of games have different types of gameplay and need the music to work with it in different ways. And to illustrate, let's turn to one of gaming's most iconic characters, Mario. Has everybody played at least one of the Mario games? Yes, good. Well, let's start by thinking about those flashing gold coins that Mario can collect. What happens when you collect 100 of them? You get an extra life, thank you. And what does the soundtrack do when you get that extra life? Ah, well, what happens is you get this little musical sting that sits on top of the rest of the music. Let's have a quick look. Did you all hear it? Okay, my next question is, where in the game does the player collect that hundredth gold coin? Okay, now this is a bit of a trick question. It could happen at any point. In other words, that little sting, that little piece of music has to work with the rest of the soundtrack, no matter when it happens in the game. Now we call that an event driven cue. It's a music cue that triggers in response to a particular game event. In terms of game logic and programming, it's actually very easy to implement. You monitor the gameplay for a particular thing, and when that particular thing happens, you play the music. The challenge here is almost entirely creative. How do you write a little piece of music like that that can be layered on top of another piece of music at any point without the two clashing? But in Mario Land, the interaction also doesn't end there. Every now and then, Mario picks up a superstar and gets a period of invincibility. And what happens with the soundtrack this time? Well, here, the music changes, and it changes quite dramatically. Again, let's have another quick listen. <laughs> So do you all hear it? The music transforms from the familiar overworld theme into what's kind of an almost Latin style double time stomp. Now because there's a, a much more substantial change involved here, it requires a slightly different technique. This one's called horizontal resequencing. The best way to think of it is to imagine the timeline of a game as a horizontal line stretching out in front of you. Now this time when a game event happens, or in this case when Mario collects the superstar, the main soundtrack, the over, what you get is a series of abrupt jumps in the music, a bit like randomly flicking between radio stations. So it's not an easy task to write two or more different contrasting pieces of music that work in such a way as to make it possible to transition seamlessly between them. That's where the real craft of video game music lies. It's, it's in thinking about music and how it works and what it's for in a completely new way. It's about thinking of recorded music like that as a sort of dynamic, performative, living, breathing thing, something that only exists in the moment. Now, although you might have not have thought about it in those terms, a video game soundtrack is maybe closer to a live gig, a jazz gig or a DJ set maybe, than it is to a traditional audio recording. And on that subject of DJing, there's one more approach that I'd like to talk about. This one is called vertical reorchestration. Now, the best way to think of this is to think of it as being a way of dynamically remixing the game's soundtrack, adding and subtracting layers of sound as the player navigates around the game. 
Now, do any of you listen to remixes or has anyone ever used something like GarageBand or Ableton to do a remix of your own? Okay, so a few of you are nodding. The idea is really quite simple. You work with an existing piece of music and then you add bits. Maybe some new drum hits or a completely new loop or you add some chords or some synth pads and you turn the original track into something else. Vertical reorchestration is essentially that same process but automated and synced to the gameplay. So, for example, you could imagine a situation where in a first-person shooter, as the player gets closer to an end-of-level boss, you would want the music to build in intensity and then peak just as the player enters the room where the final showdown is going to take place. Vertical reorchestration would measure the player's proximity to the boss as a metric, just a way of measuring and keeping track of what's happening in the game at each moment in time. And then at certain threshold points, it would remix, introducing new elements to the music, maybe adding some elements to the percussion track to make the drum line busier and more frantic, or a rhythm guitar line, or maybe thickening out the harmonic progression by doubling up on parts. Now, there are all sorts of little compositional tricks that a film composer would use in a situation like that. But as I said before, how a film composer would approach that task is slightly different. They would decide on a particular musical strategy for the build-up. They would work out from the film how to pace it, and then they would write one piece of music that could be dubbed on and that will just work time and time again. What a video game composer has to do is conceive of and compose multiple pathways and multiple musical options. Not as complete pieces of music, but as individual musical layers that can be added automatically and that will work together to create the sort of musical buildup that's needed as it's needed. Here's another example. Now, I might start off with something really simple like this, just a bass line. And then as we play through the level, we begin to introduce some drums and some keyboards. Then we can busy some things up with some scratching. We can pull in a synth lead and then before you know it, we've thickened up the mix a bit. Of course, it doesn't need to be all one way. If we want to, we can drop out elements to bring the level back down again. This time, though, the game logic is a bit more complex than before. The computer is having to intelligently remix the music rather than just stop and start pieces of music at specific points in time. Think of it as being like that club DJ that I mentioned who can spin and mix tracks without a break to get a crowd dancing for hours, as opposed to the sort of party DJ that you might hire for your granny's birthday who'll come along and just play through a playlist by sequencing uh, different tracks one after the other. Now, it matters how and when those different layers of sound are mixed together. Are they just dropped into the mix? Are they cross-faded? Should we wait until the start of the next musical phrase or the next bar before we bring them in because that makes the most musical sense? Or do we transition immediately so that we don't lose a high degree of synchronization with the gameplay? Now, the answers to those questions depend on context. And normally, they're questions that a composer or a sound mixer would answer before writing the music and then coding into the game logic. So in a sense, the video game composer has to anticipate each possible eventuality, provide the musical layers that will make those eventualities work, and then build a set of concrete rules of musical play that will enable the game music system to make those decisions and engineer a game soundtrack that works in the moment and in real time. So it's by working across those three different techniques, event-driven cues, horizontal resequencing, and vertical reorchestration, that many of today's video games manage to create those tightly synchronized interactive game soundtracks that evolve with the game. 
What the latest platforms like the Xbox and the PS4 provide developers with are stable hardware platforms with enough raw processing power to handle all of that high-definition, production-quality, multi-channel audio. And the processing that's necessary to make these techniques work effectively, particularly when that music has to work alongside ultra-high-resolution 4K graphics, artificially intelligent non-player characters, online streaming, and different types of player input control. You throw in things like head-mounted VR displays like the HTC Vive that track your movement in space, and headphone surround sound that also tracks your movement and changes your sonic experience depending on where you are in the game and where you're looking at that particular point in time. And you begin to get a feel for just how complex modern game soundtracks need to be and why the latest generation of games consoles have a level of processing power that is millions of times greater than the hardware that powered Pong. But of course, as new technologies come along, developers come up with ever more inventive ways to use that increased power. It's a bit like a game of cat and mouse with developers challenging the capabilities of whatever hardware platforms are currently available. And then companies like Microsoft and Sony developing and releasing hardware that has enough power to meet those needs and stay ahead of the game, at least for a while. It's a sort of symbiotic relationship, a combination of developing technology and technique that has led composers and game designers to rethink music and how it works. And I think, interestingly, it's led to completely new types of entertainment experience. Has anyone played either the Chinese room's Dear Esther or Everyone's Gone to the Rapture? OK, one or two people have played them. These, I think, are really interesting. They both use interactive music to create an experience of play that's very different to what most people think of when they think of gaming. Now, these games are sometimes called walking simulators, which is a slightly dismissive name that comes from the way that the games are designed. The player is just dropped into a location and a situation, and the only gameplay mechanic that they have is to walk through the space and explore it. The point of the gameplay is simply to explore and make sense of the world you find yourself in and the experiences that you have within it. The story, if there is one, is really one that emerges from that exploration rather than something that exists as a backdrop to the game and that directs the gameplay. And in that respect, these titles are maybe more like interactive experiences that are delivered using game interfaces and game technologies than they are traditional games, and where the player is in control of how those experiences play out. Now, looking to the future, I think that this combination of new technologies, new approaches to music composition, and new game concepts is going to lead to completely new ways of experiencing and even writing and performing music. Now, at the moment, for example, uh, James and I are working with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra on a series of projects that combine live orchestral music, interactive composition, and video game concepts and technologies. Now, the RSNO is interested in how they might use interactive game music as part of the work that they do in schools. But really, they're interested in using gaming and music to, com to create completely new types of concert experience. I'll let my colleague Bill Chandler from the RSNO tell you about how they've used Minecraft to do just that. In 2016, the RSNO launched a fresh, innovative approach to presenting school concerts using an element that practically every child in Scotland loves, Minecraft. One of the most important things that we do is to bring orchestral music to children, especially for the very first time. The RSNO presented five sold-out concerts in its new state-of-the-art RSNO Centre to over 2,000 really excited kids. Every teacher receives a specially devised training session and a resource pack. And before each concert, each school got uh, a visit from an RSNO musician 
who actually worked with them to create their own music based on the, the music that they were going to hear in the concert. This adds a completely different level to the actual concert experience itself because every child in the audience knows somebody on the stage and that connection transforms the whole experience. The most original thing we did on this concert was to commission young Scottish composer Jay Catherall to write us a new piece of music. Jay's idea was to create a piece of music that kids can explore just like a game of Minecraft. Children direct the play on the screen in a live version on a server that we've created. Subsequently, the orchestra then, according to the kids' wishes, actually plays music for each world that they explore, resulting in a performance that is completely different every time. And on, over here on the left, we've got two more to choose. We have yellow and orange. What would you guys like? <laughs> but that's really just the beginning. I think with the advent of immersive virtual reality that we're looking at another breakthrough moment in interactive music. Now, already, we're seeing new technologies that offer new possibilities and new ways of thinking about how music works to provide those immersive gaming and entertainment experiences. One of the big challenges, though, is that developers are still trying to work out what is and what isn't possible in VR and how existing gameplay experiences might translate across. Very often, what works when you play a game on a console and a TV screen doesn't necessarily work when you translate it into virtual space. Not long ago, I spoke to Laura Dilloway, who works with Guerrilla Games, who produced the VR combat game Rigs. The development challenge was, in principle, quite simple. They were taking a fast-paced action combat game that worked very well as a console game, and then trying to create a similar VR gaming experience. Unfortunately, with all of that fast-paced action, the move to head-mounted VR caused nearly everyone who played it to feel motion sick. And the team had to invest so much time and effort in resolving the interface and mode of play that the sound of music wasn't top at the list of development priorities. Now, of course, that's understandable, but it's also a bit of a shame because I think sound and music are elements that really help you to connect emotionally and physically with spaces. And in virtual reality, which is all about immersing the user in a virtual space, sound and music could and should play a very important role in that interfacing. Now, that's one of the reasons that I, along with some colleagues from the University of Edinburgh, have been developing a new kind of VR experience, one that features music as one of its key points of interface, and that's designed to explore the way that we experience sound and music in virtual space, and how that could open up new approaches to gaming, and maybe even how we experience live music in the future. So at this point, I'll pass over to another James, this time James II, to tell you all a bit about the project. James. Thank you, Kenny. Now, some of you might have come across the idea of acoustics before, the sense that when we hear a sound, we don't ever hear that sound in isolation. Instead, we're hearing it colored by the sound of the environment. All of the little reflections that happen as the sound bounces off the walls, the ceiling, or the floor. Now, the acoustic of a space is one of those things that really helps to create the sense of being enveloped in sound. And it also contributes enormously to our sense that the sounds we're listening to come from the same space than the one that we're in. Now, I'm really interested in early music, particularly music from the 15th and 16th centuries. And one of the really big challenges that I face um, is that the spaces that the composers and musicians of the time would have known simply don't exist anymore. And as a modern audience, we can never really get the chance to experience the music as it would have been heard five or 600 years ago. So we thought, what if we could create VR and use it to recreate those spaces? combining music performance and gaming in a way that allows us to step back into the past. Now, over the last year and a bit, we've been working with Historic Environments Scotland, who manage many of Scotland's heritage sites, uh, including Stirling Castle, just up the road, um, to try and create the acoustics of one of their sites, the chapel at Lenithgow Palace. Now, 
As a historic building, Lanisco Palace is really, really important. It was one of the major royal palaces of Scotland, and it was also where James V was born around Easter in 1512. We know that his father, James IV, would have celebrated Easter Mass there because James V was baptized in that same chapel that same weekend. Wouldn't it be great, we thought, if visitors to the palace could get a sense of what that sounded like, to be able to stand in the chapel, step back in time, and experience all the sounds and sensations of the music being performed in that room. And of course, it is a great idea, but it's also really not practical, at least in the real Linithgow Palace. As you can see from this photo, the building today is really little more than a shell. It doesn't have a roof, let alone floorboards, plasterwork, or any of the magnificent interior drapes or hangings that would originally have been there. We've been there, we've tried singing and making noise, and all that really happens is the wind carries the sound away. It's impossible to get a sense of how that space would have sounded to James IV. What we realized, of course, was that VR gave us both a set of tools to do the sort of reconstruction work that we wanted to do without risking any damage to the original buildings, but it also gave us a way of putting users into the space so they could interact and play with the music recordings that they were hearing. Back to Kenny. Thank you, James. And one of the challenges that we faced, though, was that VR has in the past largely been a visual medium. We didn't really have the development tools or the workflows that we needed to produce the music, get it into VR, and then bring it to life acoustically. That's really what our project has been about. And it is, I think, one of the next important steps in game audio. How do we build on the production techniques that we've been looking at today and develop them so that they meet the needs of immersive VR? What will VR soundtracks even sound like? And what role has music to play in VR gaming? One big challenge for us was that we couldn't just record the music in the usual way by taking musicians either into the studio or to a performance venue and recording there. That would have captured all of the acoustics of the real space. And when we took it into our VR space, we would have been adding layers of artificial acoustic to the real one. And that would have sounded, well, a bit weird. What we did then was take our musicians into an anechoic chamber. Now, has anybody heard of an anechoic chamber before? Uh, one or two. It's a space that's been specially designed to have no natural acoustic. You stand on a suspended floor and all of the walls and the ceiling and the floor beneath you are covered in these dense acoustic tiles that diffuse and soak up all of the sound energy. All you can hear in there is your own heartbeat and the blood flowing through your ears. It really is a very weird space to be in because, as we said earlier, in everyday life, we never hear sound like that in its raw state. It's always colored by the environment. Here's a, a quick recording that shows how a sound changes as we move from that dry anechoic sound through to the same sound recorded in an acoustic space. Hallelujah. Our poor performers, they all look relatively happy here, but they had an awful time during that recording session. For them, it was more than just weird. It was a really challenging space to perform in. I don't know if any of you are singers, but one of the things that singers do is use the acoustics of a space to help with tuning and intonation and timing. Now, all of those things disappeared in the anechoic chamber, and it took a long time and multiple takes and a lot of edits to get a set of recordings that we were happy with and that we could then use to drop in to our virtual space. Once it was in there, though, it demonstrated a different type of interaction. Here, the quality of sound changes as the user moves around the space in relation to the sound source. It's a way of interacting and playing with space itself and the associated acoustics as a dimension of music performance. 
Just imagine, though, translating that back to gaming. Imagine playing a first-person role-playing game, a horror game maybe, where the eerie acoustics of a space create a, a true sense of being immersed in the action. It opens up all sorts of creative possibilities. Now, this seems like quite a good point to invite someone else up from the audience to have a shot at the experience. Could we have a volunteer who'd like to step into the past? Excellent. Up you come. Give them a round of applause. And you are? Here. Sorry? Keir. Keir. Nice to meet you, Keir. Right. I'll hand you over to James II. He'll get you into the space. And I'll tell the audience a wee bit about what we're going to experience because it's a a wee bit involved doing this transition. What we're going to do is put Keir here into Linlithgow Palace in the present day. So what we'll see at first is a virtual copy of that photograph that we saw on screen a moment ago. So lots of bare stone walls, stone floors, and of course, no ceiling. And what we should hear coming over the PA system in just a moment is the sound of our anechoic recordings as they're played through our virtual model of that space. I quite think that uh, VR is actually a better spectator sport than it is uh, user engagement. It's fun to watch people wander around like zombies. Okay, so if you look over to the monitor here, you'll see what Keir can see. And if you look very closely, you'll notice that two of the singers bear a startling resemblance to myself and James. And Keir, if you could look up and see the open sky and the derelict arches of the building as it is. Are you ready to step into the past, Keir? Okay, I'll get James to make the transition. And this time, you should notice quite a dramatic change. Uh, in actual fact, the acoustic isn't as live as you might expect, because we think that uh, they were very aware of the quality of sound in the space and dressed it with the interior fabrics to control the live acoustic. But this is laid out. As you can see, the architecture is quite ornate. And this is laid out with decorative objects, uh, just as we think it would have been uh, back in 1512, and the architectural historians from Historic Environment Scotland have advised us on the layout, the structure, and the design of all of the objects. Okay, and shall we pull Keir back into the present day? And while he's coming back out, please give him another warm round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Keir. Now, one immediate application of this sort of thing is that it provides organizations like Historic Environments Scotland with new ways of engaging the public with its buildings. Just imagine going to visit Linlithgow Palace or the tunnels underneath St Andrew's Castle and being able to step back into the past and through interactive storytelling and realistic rendered visuals and immersive sound and music, bring those spaces to life. How much more engaging might history be as a subject? What new perspectives might that give us on the spaces and the music of the time? And how much more might you learn if you could combine that idea of exploratory games like walking simulators with these new immersive and sound technologies? But there are other interesting offshoots from this too. Now, when you think of classical music, you maybe don't immediately think of people doing exciting and innovative things with technology. But we've been working with the classical music label Hyperion and a group of singers, the Banshwa Consort, who you saw in the anechoic chamber earlier, to produce what we think is the world's first classical album recorded and produced entirely in virtual reality. So the consort are going to record the music in the anechoic chamber, and Hyperion's engineers are going to be using our VR acoustic tools to mix and master the recordings. 
What we're also hoping to do is develop a companion app that lets listeners download additional content recorded in the anechoic chamber and then remix it in VR so that they can listen to each piece in different locations and at different points in time. Now again, like those walking simulators, that's maybe not a game in the traditional sense, but it is an example of play and an example of gamification taking some of the elements and the mechanics of gameplay and introducing them to other non-gaming situations. What I think it shows, though, is that there's enormous potential here. We're only just scratching the surface of what's possible with sound and music in VR. It's going to take time for people to figure out the mechanics of what's possible, what works and what doesn't, and what the new codes and conventions are for VR as a medium. I think it's only then that creatives will be able to come in and push the boundaries of what's, what's possible by creating new types of playing experience and new ways of listening to and interacting with game audio. Now, that might be new types and styles of game. It might be new ways to listen to and experience music. Or it might be something else entirely, something that we can't yet imagine. So let's, before we finish, just recap what we've touched on today. We've had a look at how video games came to sound the way that they did, and that was largely a result of people playing with the technology at the boundaries of possibility, pushing against the constraints of hardware and game design to create music that integrates tightly with gameplay experiences. We've seen how as game soundtracks developed, composers developed new approaches to composition that matched the pace and mood of the music to interactive gameplay. And then finally, we've seen that with virtual reality, we've almost come full circle. We're back to a situation where the technology is new and the possibilities that it offers are seemingly boundless. In fact, we need to work out where the boundaries of possibility are before we can start to push back against them. And in fact, it will be you that does that. You're the generation who are going to figure out what VR is really good for and what new and exciting modes of entertainment and education it opens up. Now, all of you are here because you're interested in sound and music. And as we established right back at the start, almost all of you are interested in gaming and interactive entertainment. So I'd encourage you all to embrace it. Look and play, but most of all, listen. All of you can have a role to play in what happens next, whether that's as players, creators, or consumers. The only real limit is your imagination. Thank you.